My name is Jason Rogers, the politics doctor. And I think right now, given our current political system, no one can argue that we do, in fact, need a doctor. I'll be curing political confusion one issue at a time. And today we're going to start with my first issue, which is government spending. As we see from the physical cliff debacle that's been going on, and now we're coming up on the debt ceiling issue, this whole argument about overspending has become the, the main theme. We hear Republicans talking about how we need to cut spending. Democrats say, yes, we need to cut spending, but we also need to raise revenues. We need to have a balanced approach. Well, I'm going to kind of break down some of this, some of this theory into actual data that you can use. Uh, on my YouTube videos, you will not see a bunch of theory and philosophical stuff. You're going to see empirical data to back up the things that I say. And we're going to start by just defining a couple of terms that people often have issue with, and that is the federal debt and federal deficit. I know that a lot of people have a hard time deciphering on which one means what. The federal debt is simply the accumulated amount of money that the federal government owes domestic and foreign investors. Domestic investors are those American citizens who bought treasury bonds and of course foreign investors are other countries who bought our treasury bonds. And a good third of the entire debt we owe to our own government for raiding the social security coffers. We'll get into more of that later. But it's accumulated over many, many years. Basically our country has been using deficit spending since the very beginning, we were just better at handling, paying it down uh, in the early years, and over the past hundred years, we haven't done that well. Now, the federal deficit re refers to revenues on a yearly basis. If revenues are less than expenditures, okay, that means that we don't collect enough money to pay the expenditures that we've outlaid for the year, then that's called a deficit, and that's what we've been running for a long time mostly is, is deficit. Re if revenues are more than expenditures, we have what's called a surplus. That means there's money left over. That money can be given back in the form of tax cuts back to the citizens or it can be invested into another program. And we saw that uh, Bill Clinton in his final year left a surplus for George Bush going into, into the 2000 uh, election and uh, George Bush decided to give that and in, in back in the form of tax breaks. Revenues, if revenues equal expenditures, then we have what's called a balanced budget, which doesn't happen all that often. Now, let's talk for just a minute about the debt, the, the terms we use to come up with some of these, these numbers that we're talking about, some of these formulas. Uh, def deficit spending as a percentage of GDP. That's a very popular one that you hear all the time. You hear them mostly in sound bites, and there's very little explanation given as to what that really means. GDP just refers to gross domestic product. That's just all the income for the entire country for an entire year. Everything we brought in. Spending as a percentage of GDP, basically all you do is you take the spending, the, 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 the budget, you divide by the GDP, and it gives you this percentage. For example, if we spend $3.5 trillion, which is about what we spend a year right in the last few years, and GDP is $15 trillion, which will probably be higher than that, but let's just use that as an example. Then spending as a percentage of GDP is 23.3%, which is high. Now there's a couple of myths I want to talk about as for this percentage of GDP that given one side or the other, you can take this formula, you can take that number, and come to a lot of different conclusions with it. The first myth is that if GDP, if percentage of GDP goes up, then we're spending more money, right? Obviously, if the budget goes up and GDP stays the same, then that percent of GDP is going to go up. Well, that's false. It doesn't automatically mean that. And here's an example why. During the recession, GDP fell drastically. If we spend the same amount of money and the GDP drops largely, then the percent of GDP is going to rise sharply without spending changing much at all. And a lot of the, most of the stuff that we spend, we can't just go up and down on our budget every year depending on whether we had a good year or not, whether GDP was good that year. There's a lot of obligations that we have to spending that we've got to spend it. Okay, so 
that's the first myth I want to talk about. The second myth is the idea that Republicans are more fiscally conservative or better spenders than Democrats. We keep hearing this over and over again, and it's not true. Both sides spend money, oftentimes recklessly. And I'm going to show you that. Now, if you look at this graph we've got here, this is the U.S. federal debt as a percentage of GDP by president or political party, so to speak. Now, I know that the president doesn't get the final say on the budget. He does propose a budget. Congress has to pass it. The Senate has to pass it. And the president has to sign it. The reason that the president gets credit and blame for this kind of thing is because the buck kind of stops with him. If he can veto a budget, if he says, look, this spending is just out of control, I'm not going to allow it, he can veto it, and it takes a lot. It takes two-thirds of the House and the Senate to override his veto, which happens very rarely. So the president does have a lot of power, a lot of pull when negotiating this, and this is why he's always at the table with the, the, Repub the Republicans and Democrats in both houses of Congress before it gets to veto time because they don't want to pass a bill that's just going to turn around and be vetoed after that. So they're going to all work together and try to work this out, the House, the Senate, and the President. If you look at this chart, you'll see that as a percentage of GDP, of course we peaked there, you see that high number at 120, over 120 percent. That was reaction to uh, the Great Depression. And as you can see under Roosevelt, their, their numbers went up really steep, and then they started going back down as the economy got better, and there were a lot of factors involved in that. But as you can see, Republicans and Democrats were steadily decreasing that number all the way through Carter until we get to Reagan. Now, Reagan was a big spender. Reagan liked to do two things at the same time that really hurt the revenue side. He liked to cut taxes, and he liked to increase spending on military. And, 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 of course, the Cold War had a lot to do with that. And then you see under Clinton, the Democrat, it starts to go back down again as a percentage of GDP. Then you see under Bush, it starts to rise back up again. And then as you see at the end there on Bush's last year, it starts to really climb and continues to do that in response to the Great Recession, which is not what nearly as bad as the Great Depression, but it was the worst we've had since the Great Depression. And as you can see, the numbers start to look like what they did under Roosevelt there when he was trying to deal with the Great Depression. Any president that we would have elected in 2008 or this current election, this would have increased in response to the recession. Because Keynesian economics dictates that you flood the market with income, with, with revenue, to stimulate the economy. Bush kind of did this with the bailout uh, right there, to, right at the end of his term, and of course Obama did the stimulus package right after that, which greatly increased uh, GDP, I mean, not GDP, but the, uh, the spending, and of course raised the percentage of GDP. Now, who spends more? Both parties spend, but do it differently. Republicans they like to spend money on the military, war, and tax cuts. And yes, tax cuts are an expenditure. We'll get to that later. But under Republicans, the reason that the debt climbs so steadily, more than Democrats does, the, the, the national debt actually does increase faster under Republicans. And that's because their spending they like to put on the credit card. The theory is, is that if you lower taxes, then GDP grows and government gets more revenue from that growth. And there's some truth to that. But Reagan tripled the national debt in the 1980s with this philosophy, and it's been steadily increasing using the philosophy ever since then. There's a cutoff to where you, you can't tax your way to prosperity, but you can't tax cut your way the prosperity either. There's a balance in the middle and for the past 30 to 40 years we, the balance has been way off. The taxes have been extraordinarily low. Right now we're seeing the lowest taxes on corporations, people, income that we've seen since the 50s. Okay, Now regardless of what you may hear on some of the news channels, taxes are at, an, at a low we haven't seen in 50 years. Okay, So when you lower taxes, which lowers your revenue, and you increase your spending on the military or you have a war that you're confronting or even a recession, then your debt's going to go way up because you're not bringing in the revenue to offset it. 
Now, Democrats, on the other hand, they like to invest in social programs and infrastructure. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, infrastructure, uh, uh, educate, which is education, building new bridges, new roads, these kind of things. They like to raise taxes rather than borrow as much. They raise taxes and they borrow, which means that the increase in the debt is more slowly under Democrats because they're not borrowing quite as much at a time. Okay. Now, let's talk about some uh, possible solutions to get out of this spending problem that we've got so we stop having deficits, which add to the to national debt, and we start having at least balanced budgets, hopefully surpluses, where we can pay down the national debt. First of all, you want an increase in GDP. Obviously, the, the higher the GDP, the more revenue the government's going to collect via taxes at any rate, and we're going to be we're going to be able to balance the budget more. To do this, you have to stimulate the economy so that GDP increases. The the the, uh, the the theory is is that under Keynesian economics is that there's a big hole in the economy during a recession. People aren't spending; they're afraid. So what the government does is it invests in things. It spends and, and uh, under Obama, this was the stimulus package. It invested all these things that should pay off big in the long run. And the market itself won't invest in them at that time because it's afraid. The market's afraid in a recession that they're going to invest in things that are just going to fold up and they're going to lose their money. Well, the government steps in and invests in some of these things because it has the resources to do that and wait it out over the long period to get the, the big, bigger bang for the buck later. So we have to make better investments so that we can increase GDP. Otherwise, we just go further in debt and GDP doesn't rise. Secondly, we're going to have to raise taxes. And I don't just mean on the rich people. Everybody's going to have to pay more in taxes. In my opinion, Obama should have never cut the payroll tax because that payroll tax goes to pay for the Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, which we already are struggling to figure out how we're going to pay for it in the long run. I just don't think that helped the individual enough, uh, that little bit they saw in their paycheck every week, to offset the long-term problem that we're going to have from it, which is expired now anyway. We're going to have to cut some of these breaks, loopholes, and tax credits that we have. That's the easiest way to fix a revenue problem, is to simply cut out some of the loopholes and breaks. For instance, right now the top rate is 35% on wealthy people. The average multi-multi-millionaire pays about half that in taxes because of all the loopholes and tax breaks and credits that they get. So we're going to have to raise everybody's taxes, maybe the payroll tax and all, uh, cut out some of the credits and the tax breaks that even the middle class get. But we're going to have to raise the marginal rates on the highest earners as well. They're going to have to pay more than 20%. As we saw, Mitt Romney, because of the capital gains tax break, he only paid 14% on $46 million, which is insane. Okay, so we're going to have to fix some of these things, and, and taxes are going to have to go up on everybody, regardless of, of what you hear from Democrats or Republicans. That's just the cold, hard truth. We're going to have to decrease spending as well. Increasing GDP and raising taxes is not going to completely solve the problem. We're going to have to make sensible cuts where we can and we're going to talk later about some of the potential areas where we can do this. Now let's just take a look for a second at government spending as a whole. How much do we spend? We spend around $3.8 trillion. In the last few years, that's about where we've been. That's where we're probably going to be on this next budget. And if you look at this little pie chart, it shows you where this money is currently going. The highest, of course, is defense at 24%. And then we go to health care, about 22%. And those numbers fluctuate. They're usually about equal. Pensions at 22%, which just simply refers to Social Security payments. Welfare at 12%. And that's all your projects like uh, uh, SNAP, uh, the, the, the food stamp program SNAP. That covers housing, Section 8 housing, all these kind of programs to help poor people. And then you see education there is 4%. Interest on the debt is around 6%. And those all those little things right there, at two or three, four percent. We're not going to talk about too much. We're going to hit start with the big ones and work our way down because that makes the most sense. If you're doing your own personal budget, you're going to start with the highest expense you got, 
to see where you can get the most cut from and kind of work your way down through the other cuts. So in order for this to make sense, let's talk about how spending is done. And as you can see from our little graph here, we have two types of spending, mandatory spending and discretionary spending. Of course, you also have interest on the debt, which is kind of a third, but I kind of put that in there with the mandatory spending because we have to pay the interest on our debt. We have to make those payments. Mandatory spending just simply means that there's a formula out there that people qualify for, for funds or they don't. In order to, for the government to cut these things, they would have to change current laws and eligibility requirements to, to make changes here. They can't just cut it. Discretionary spending is much easier to cut. It's done on a, a decisions made by Congress on a year-by-year -year basis anyway. So, and, that, and most of that's defense spending, and we're going to go into that more of, of which spending is which. But discretionary spending makes up about a third of the spending, and that's the simplest place to start to make cuts because you don't have to change laws to do that. So let's look at where this mandatory spending goes. Under health care, you see Medicare, Medicaid are the biggest chunks of this. Medicare, for instance, is the biggest at $560 billion, and that goes to all the seniors. Uh, 55 and over who qualify to get uh, med what is it, medical insurance. But keep in mind that Medicare is not really free health care for everybody. Most seniors have to have supplemental insurance to cover other things which comes out of their Social Security check and whatnot. So it's not just free health care for seniors. Okay? And Medicaid, of course, is health care that goes to pay for the poor, mostly children of the poor. And then you have Social Security down there. Old age and survival insurance, these are our, our pension payments, our Social Security payments. And then you have disability down there, and these are set up as well on a formula. Keep in mind that Social Security has its own trust fund that typically runs surpluses until the government decides to dip into it. Okay, so but we'll talk about that more later. And then, of course, you have the income security, which is the unemployment benefits that we've been having to extend uh, because of the recession. You have the earned income and child tax credits. You have the SNAP food stamps program. Uh, then you have veterans issues down here at the bottom. So this is all our mandatory spending. And this can be quite difficult to get Congress to change laws and requirements to, to make these things go away. Now, if you look at the discretionary spending here on our little chart, you see uh, uh, most of it's for defense. Defense is a huge thing. And this isn't all defense spending. Defense spending is a kind of a tricky thing because a lot of defense spending isn't in the defense budget. For instance, nuclear weapons are in the energy department. And so there's ways that we can kind of hide some of this defense spending, which really is over a trillion dollars a year. I know you're going to look it up and it's going to say $600, $700 billion. It's just not true. It's really around a trillion, maybe more. That's total defense spending, national security stuff included. So then you have non-defense spending, which you have education, training, employment, transportation, income security, health, and all these things, they don't add up to a whole lot left after the military spending as part of our discretionary spending. So just to give a little recap, this will be the end of our first installment on government spending. I don't want to go too long and ramble on and on, which I easily could. I'm trying to keep these right at 20 minutes so that we don't doze off while we're listening to them. Uh, we talked about the national debt and the national deficit. The national debt is accumulated debt. Deficit are yearly deficits where we don't take in as much as we spend for that year. Both parties spend. They just do it a little differently. We have to raise GDP, raise taxes, and cut spending. All of these things is a balanced plan if we really want to tackle the problem, the spending problem, or the deficit problem. And we have two types of spending, mandatory and discretionary spending, which, which discretionary spending is only a third of the spending, but is much easier to make cuts to. Mandatory spending is the bigger chunk, but it's very difficult because laws have to be changed and rules have to be changed. Again, I'm Jason Rogers. I'm the politics doctor. And I will have part two of this installment where we'll look into more detail at where we might could make some cuts. And I encourage you to get a, Google all these things that I'm talking about. Look at my numbers. Make sure they're right. Look at my philosophy, how it stacks up with some others, to see if I'm just full of it 
Or do I make any sense? I encourage you to do that. Don't just take my word for it. I want you to get involved and actually research some of these things. I know that we have busy lives. I have two children and I run my own business. But I try to keep up with this because it really does have a direct impact on our lives. And if the debt keeps going up, it's going to have a huge impact on our children and grandchildren. So look forward to part two, which will be more in-depth stuff on the government spending. And until then, have a great week and please stay involved. My name is Jason Rogers, the politics doctor, and I think right now, given our current political system, no one can argue that we do, in fact, need a doctor. I'll be curing political confusion one issue at a time, and today we're going to start with my first issue, which is government spending. As we see from the physical cliff debacle that's been going on, and now we're coming up on the debt ceiling issue, this whole argument about overspending has become the, the main theme. We hear Republicans talking about how we need to cut spending. Democrats say, yes, we need to cut spending, but we also need to raise revenues. We need to have a balanced approach. Well, I'm going to kind of break down some of, this, some of this theory into actual data that you can use. Uh, on my YouTube videos, you will not see a bunch of theory and philosophical stuff. You're going to see empirical data to back up the things that I say. And we're going to start by just defining a couple of terms that people often have issue with, and that is the federal debt and federal deficit. I know that a lot of people have a hard time deciphering on which one means what. The federal debt is simply the accumulated amount of money that the federal government owes domestic and foreign investors. Domestic investors are those American citizens who bought treasury bonds and of course foreign investors or other countries who bought our treasury bonds. And a good third of the entire debt